Welcome back to the Warehouse Podcast. I'm Tyler. I'm Jesse. And I'm Eli. And this is a special morning edition of the podcast. We've all wrangled each other together on a Sunday morning, well before Jesse's waking hours, typically, to record a very important preview episode of the 2024 season. Jesse, how are you doing this morning in the early hours? I'm good. I'm I'm awake <laughs> now. So, yeah, I'm ready. Wait, okay. He's going to have to warm up a little bit. Uh, he's usually in bed for another, I think, two or three hours at this point. So we're really, we really appreciate it. But um, Eli, how are you doing over there? I'm good. I'm uh, getting, yeah, getting the pod in. And then I'm going to fly to LA for my job, spend a week out there. Nice. And I might go see the Dodgers home opener on Friday. Oh, so that's exciting. That would be pretty cool. Have you been to Dodger Stadium before? I have not. I've never spent any significant time in LA. So it should be okay. fun. Yeah. Sounds awesome, Jess. You he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna wear his Otani jersey there probably. Am I his, his Angels Otani jersey? No, I got a Dodgers. Oh, one. you got a Dodgers one. Okay. I just like I I thought you know this was a move that just made sense, and it is putting <laughs> the best player of you know the two thousands at least, maybe the best player ever, and it is putting him in this huge spotlight, and that cannot be anything but good for baseball. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not at all worried about the recent news uh, around. I, I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Cespedes family barbecue guys were talking and <laughs> they they said something that I thought actually made a lot of sense. And they said, the one thing we can all take solace in is that Shohei was definitely not the one betting. And the reason we can know that for sure is that there is no person addicted to gambling who goes ahead and says, okay, you keep that $680 million mm -hmm. and I'll just come get it in a couple of years. Right. That just never happens. People mm -hmm. don't know how to manage money and Shohei clearly does. So <laughs> yeah. I think not, uh, not so much for the interpreter to get into a four and a half million dollar hole. At right. least that part. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> eBay had it so good you know he was just like universally beloved. He was associated with the coolest guy maybe in the entire world mm -hmm. and he just he blew it he just blew it fumbled the bag to a I tremendous know, fumbled degree. the bag that's right i mean yeah we'll see what comes out I, it's a very confused the fact that his lawyers have changed the story already one time it's yeah. i get they're trying to protect their guy so we'll see i in my heart of hearts i want to say that show a a good guy you know as far as multi-millionaires go and hopefully he did nothing wrong but we'll see hopefully your your jersey was a good i don't even know how much they cost yeah. anymore but a, a good hundred dollars spent i don't know <laughs> yeah it was too much well i will say i that i shamelessly my parents were like can you give me a christmas list and i'm like okay i'm 29 years old so i don't like keep a list of things that yeah, yeah. i haven't been able to get for myself throughout the year and so that was the thing that i put on for them so okay. that was my big pr christmas present nice jesse did you get a jersey uh, for christmas i i did not but <laughs> my my whole thing is just a question of you know the commitment to the Orioles. You know, like oh, are the are the fans listening to this aggrieved uh, that their host is going around? What you know with a, a Dodgers jersey? I, so I, I don't know. But I plan to have many jerseys of all shapes and sizes and colors and teams throughout my life. I I have three Orioles jerseys and I have like an Ichiro and an Otani jersey. So I'm not like. Yeah, I, I'm clearly biased toward the Orioles still, you know, I guess Orioles plus Japanese generational talents. Yeah, that's, that's like... right. <laughs> Japanese generational <laughs> talents. <laughs> Just no Yankee jerseys and no Red yeah, Sox no, jerseys, no, 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 obviously. No, no. OK, Aaron, Aaron, Judge you... could, Aaron Judge could be a stand up comedian, <clears throat> the president, an author, and he's not getting a jersey in okay. my closet. Yeah, <laughs> while he's on the Yankees. Yeah. Well, he's on the Yankees, yeah. Right. If he wants to come to Baltimore, I'll think about it. There you go. There's the line. It's been drawn, Aaron Judge. Your move. <laughs> Balls in his court. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into some Orioles stuff here. We are going to talk season preview here in just a minute. Before that, though, we're going to cover a few news items that have crossed um, in the last few days. We are just like as a, as kind of an aside here. We are recording this early in the week. We're recording it on Sunday. It'll probably post on Wednesday or Thursday, depending on, on when we get everything together. Um, so some of this news will be a little outdated, but we wanted to cover it anyway. So, of course, the the kind of the big news of the week, which shockingly overshadowed some other big news, but 
Orioles owner, Peter Angelos, has passed away at the age of 94. We know he's been sick for quite some time. And as the result of his illness, his sons have kind of taken over the team for the last few years. That has had its whole, whole its own, you know, realm of, you know, idiocy over especially the last 12 months or so. And now uh, the Angelos family we hear is selling the team and it sounds like it'll be done sooner rather than later. Um, Angelos's death potentially complicates that. I think it's still probably going to go through with with very little issue. But anyway, the, the fact that Angelos has passed away is, you know, it's a big deal. He's a he's a local guy, made his money in and around Baltimore, you know, as a as a lawyer. We know he was a pro labor guy, um, but of course, is someone who's drawn the ire of Orioles fans for the last 30 years, which is our entire lives. Essentially, he's owned the team. Um, but if we wanted to kind of just put a little space here to, you know, remember Angelos or say anything about him, uh, you know, wanted to make sure we we put the time in there to do that. But obviously a very sad day. So I don't know, Jesse or Eli, uh, if you have anything to say about Angelos or maybe what your lasting impressions will be of the Angelos era of the Baltimore Orioles, I'll, I'll kind of leave you guys some space to do that. But did, did either one of you want to share anything or your thoughts on the passing of Peter Angelos? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think that uh, the first thing that I want to say is, you know, obviously he made a lot of money for himself, but the way that he did so was, you know, like huge class action lawsuit on asbestos exposure of workers, you know, um, and so you know, there were like multiple scenarios where he was genuinely fighting for people who could not do it for themselves. Um, I think that the, it, you know, the Orioles were so far behind in the international markets because Peter Angelos said it is unethical for the U.S. to go around or like for Major League Baseball to go around throwing money around, you know, to little 16 year old kids. And, you know, we all know they have agreements in place by the time that they are 14 et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it was for ethical reasons that he was abstaining from that market as painful as that was for Orioles, the baseball team. You know, I think that it is pretty much unequivocally true that there are a lot of ethical problems with the way that Major League Baseball is operating in Latin America. And then I think, um, you know, he was frustrating to Orioles fans, but he was frustrating in a way that I, you know, I would prefer, like he said, okay, let's go get Miguel Tejada. Let's, you know, like bring in Albert Bell, bring in, you know, like, and, and he was collecting talent and he was putting money into free agents. You know, like we all talk about the Chris Davis signing is so terrible, but the fact of the matter is, you know, we had one of the best players in the world and he locked him down for a long time in Baltimore. You know, it clearly, he got bad and, you know, we were betting a, like, you know, putting money up against ourselves. It didn't sound like there was a large market. You can say whatever you want, but Angelus was willing to invest in this team. And, you know, despite the fact that he just like wasn't very good at it, you know, I, the fact that he did genuinely care, made his money in a ver fairly virtuous way. You know, I, I think that there's a lot to remember fondly about the guy. Yeah, absolutely. Jesse, did you want to add anything else there? Yeah, I mean, I think you you bring up good points um, as far as uh, personally, as far as having an owner, you know, for the Orioles um, like Angelos wasn't disagreeable to me. Like, I, you know, I never really had a situation where, like, I was like, I hate this guy, you know, on the baseball side. Unfortunately, <laughs> it didn't go well, obviously. And that's um obviously what captures most people's attention um which is uh it sort of overshadows some of the things Eli was highlighting and identifying um yeah so uh it's unfortunate um and yeah the other thing uh that I I like Eli sort of quickly debunked right there is sort of this idea that Angelos didn't want to spend money on the team right which is sort of a big misconception that has been around Baltimore for a long time. And obviously he was not running the organization. Well, that's clear. I have no objections. Uh, if someone wants to make that claim, but I don't think it's really arguable that he was unwilling to spend money. And that was the reason for the Orioles lack of success. We just did not spend it effectively. <laughs> we didn't have a good organization. Yeah. We, you know, organization wide, we were just bad. 
everything from the minor leagues to the everything Elias is doing to sort of build steps to, you know, build an actual organization that is effective and functional and hopefully looks something like the Cardinals did several years ago. Um, at all of these sorts of steps um, to build this organization, uh, Angelos and uh, the people uh, working with him uh, were not able to do that effectively, but it wasn't out of pure greed or uh, pure, you know, we're not doing what like Cleveland's been doing. Right. So it's not a situation like that. It's just the the on field end resulting a team uh, no, most of the time was not very good, um, but it wasn't it wasn't about his unwillingness to spend money because, right, we signed Chris Davis. We signed Miguel Tejada, Ubaldo uh, Jimenez, you know, were some notable <laughs> uh, big free agent signings. So obviously some of them, Davis obviously is is big even by today's standards. Uh, if you're looking at Tejada and Ubaldo, like today, they wouldn't be massive contracts, but contextually uh, for the time, you know, the 48 and 72 million to each of them. I mean, that's not insignificant. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's we, we shouldn't think that when we look back on on uh, his his ownership of the team, we shouldn't think he was a, an owner unwilling to spend money. Yeah. Absolutely. And and he's a local owner, which not every team can say they have a guy or a gal leading the team that is from the area. So that's always a cool thing. And it, you know, sounds like the Orioles are going to get handed on to another owner from the area. So that'll be nice to see as well. But yeah, sad. You don't want to see people die, even people you maybe have disagreements with. And as we kind of just pointed out, Angelus wasn't as bad as I think a lot of us thought. He just was a, a poor owner, but not necessarily a bad guy. And it's a sad day in Baltimore. And um, hopefully it's thought of that way. But yeah, just wanted to make some space for that there. And now we're going to move on to some obviously less important stuff uh, that's on the field. But specifically, the big thing I want to talk about before we get into the season preview is that Jackson Holiday is not going to make the Orioles opening day roster. Um, this is something that I think when we did our episode, as far as um, we did like roster projections a few weeks ago, it seemed like we kind of came to an agreement that Holiday wasn't going to make the roster. I think as spring training went on, he really started to hit the ball well. He was playing an exciting brand of baseball. He seemed to be adapting to second base pretty well. It kind of became evident, I guess, that he was going to make the team. He was just clearly the Orioles' best option at second base. And then we got the news late last week that he was reassigned to minor league camp. Mike Elias gave a long, winding answer about <laughs> um, needing to see more left-handed pitching needing to get adjusted to second base a little bit more. And, you know, there's some validity to that, but I think even with all that considered, it's still a bit of a ridiculous decision if you're trying to say, let's put together the best 26 players and make a roster. Um, the fact that Jackson Holiday's not on that right now, but he probably will be by May, um, is a bit of an interesting choice. But Eli, I'll go to you first and just kind of give your general thoughts on Jackson Holiday not making the team. Are you surprised? Are you up in arms? Uh, where are you at right now? I'm not too surprised. <laughs> I'm a little bit up in arms. Okay. Um. I. I. Yeah. I said. I said this a little bit in the Kyle Stowers episode I just put out. Um. I. I think what you said about putting the best 26 guys on the opening day roster is just not how the Orioles view this. You know. I. I. I think it's very very simply they are looking at what configuration allows us to maintain a baseline of success while continuing to flesh out exactly who we want to keep around for the remainder of this year. Um, you know, it is a continued spring training. It is like the opening month or two of the season leading up to the trade deadline. All of that is an evaluation period for the Orioles. And I think very simply, if you want to talk Urias, Mateo, if you want to talk, um, I, I don't know. You, you, just like looking at ways that we are eventually going to fit Heston Kerstad onto this roster, um, you know, on top of Holiday, potentially Kobe Mayo later in the season. You know, these roster spots need to get freed up, and just letting these guys go for nothing is not the way that the Orioles have operated. Um, so they're going to take these first couple months, figure things out, manipulate some service time. Jackson Holiday will be up. They're not going to be. 
Um, worried about the prospect promotion incentive. I think there are like more mature prospects who, you know, in Wyatt Langford, Evan Carter, who are probably front runners ahead of Holiday, even if he starts opening day. Um, and so I think that there is just very largely like very little incentive for the Orioles to put Holiday on this roster. Um, and they get an extra year of him if they keep him down for just a couple weeks. It's a very simple thing. Yeah. Um, to, to kind of talk about the extended spring training now at this point that he's going to go through and some of the points that Elias made was first he talked about left-handed pitching. Um, Holiday did only go, I think, two for 14 against left-handed pitching in the spring, which is obviously not good. And then he talked about strikeout rates, I think, a little bit. Holiday did strike out 31% of the time in the spring, which is also bad. And he walked only 6% of the time. So there is some like aggressiveness stuff that he's probably seeing the most advanced pitching of his life here in the spring. I'm sure he's seeing some double a, some triple a, and then obviously some big league guys. So there is, he's clearly not a finished product, but that kind of points to what you just mentioned about the more advanced prospects around him in the league that might have a better shot at getting that, that award and then getting the extra draft pick and all that stuff, not to mention the Orioles own players that might have a chance at that anyway, which I think we talked about as well with Colton Cowser. but um, yeah, so there's some legitimacy, but, but yeah, it's, it's kind of business as usual from the Orioles, but Jess interested to get you, your perspective here on, on how you were feeling when you heard that holiday didn't make the team. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the one thing to point out is I, I really question how much it is actually about these things that Elias has mentioned. Um, so, I mean, the thing is he did mention earlier that, Holiday had a legitimate chance to make the roster. Um, we know that, and a lot of Oriole fans got excited because of that. But the thing is that uh, that would never have been sort of in the Oriole style. And it's always sort of, uh, you can always find reasons why not to do something and use those as justifications. So um, if it was, if it was going to be about the best 26, obviously Holiday would have been there the entire time. Um, so I, I mean, I guess the other thing that is a little bit frustrating too, is we're probably going to end up making the reason holiday is not on the team is to accommodate somebody who will eventually not play any long-term role on this team. Um, so that's, that's sort of what's potentially frustrating about it, depending on how the roster works out. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, this is, I, I think we, especially here on this podcast, and especially props to you, Tyler, for uh, really having identified this, because I feel like you've really been the one that's, you know, sort of put your flag in the in the sand or whatever and been like, yeah, I don't think Holiday is making this team. <laughs> so props to you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, but <laughs> it, it definitely is just not in the Orioles style to accelerate him at this point and uh, to sort of be inconvenient for themselves um, a, a tiny bit uh, by putting him on the on the major league roster. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Elias has made it pretty clear that he values roster flexibility, not necessarily above all else, but it's pretty important to him. So if he can have, because if you put Holiday on the team, then you got to probably get rid of Ramon Urias or, I mean, there's other guys on here that are far less interesting than Urias. You know, there's Nick Maton is still in the mix as we're recording this. Tyler Nevin has been in camp. Colton Wong, we just learned, is not making the team, but he's been in camp. So like there's the, these other guys that are far less interesting than a Urias or whatever. But if you put Holiday on the team, then that usually makes somebody else a little bit more, you, you've got to get rid of somebody and, if you try to waive them, they're not going to get, it's a whole thing that you can just put holiday down. There's some legitimacy to things he needs to work on anyway. So let's just put him down there. Let him work on those things. Maybe an injury happens. Then we've got that person on the IL. He does all these things, these like roster gymnastics all the time that I think we kind of just need to assume that that's how he's going to operate. The thing I do want to say though, is I've seen the, the news came down. And then of course, everyone on social media is going crazy and all that. Some people were talking about, oh, well, he's not going to go down just for a couple weeks just to get like past the one additional year because we saw that with Adley. He went down until May, came up, still got enough votes to get his full year. They're going to keep him down until August. They're going to keep him down until September when he can get that full year next year and get the draft pick and and do basically the Gunnar Henderson thing where he came up for a cup of coffee in 22, 
won rookie of the year last year. And then now he's a full blown, um, you know, star in the middle of the lineup. What do you guys think about that? Or I guess let's just say, when do you think holiday is up provided he's healthy and you know, he's basically just coming up on merit. Eli, when do you think we see holiday in, in the majors? Yeah. I think the first thing that I'll say about Adley is that was partially extended, you know, whether it was an excuse or whether it was by design that was extended by the fact that he had that triceps injury early mm-hmm. on in that season. So I, I think that while there is a non-zero chance that they go the gunner route, I, I think that the more probable thing in my mind is that we bring him up in, you know, late April or May, just after the service time cut off, um, probably late April. And I think that, uh, they want him with the team for the long haul. And I think it's the energizing move. I think that very simply, we just, you know, this allows things to settle into place. And like you said, the potential of injuries that I didn't even mention, you know, if some, if one infielder gets hurt, then Jackson holiday has a free space to come up and you didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to lose anyone. You didn't have to manufacture a trade. Um, And in that way, just letting things play out, I think, um, can be helpful. So, okay. So long by, answer, er, by but, early May. Yeah. 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 Late April, early May. Jess, do you feel similarly or where you at? Yeah. I'm inclined to agree with that. I just think that the reason, the main reason uh, that I think that won't happen is because he's clearly at a certain point going to be the best option at second base. If we do, if we are like, hopefully not running someone like Mayton out there, you know, every once in a while, that's not like a tenable long-term solution for the Orioles at second base. Um, So I think eventually there's going to be sort of uh, not enough excuses even Elias can make uh, to keep (laughs) him down there. Yeah. It is interesting to think about what the infield setup is going to be to start the year. I would think that I guess in my head, it would be Westberg at second, Urias at third, Gunner short. And then the first base is O'Hearn and Mountcastle back and forth. Um, but e- e- even if Mayton is like a backup yeah. who's playing once or twice or, you know, three times a week or something that, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. It's a weird setup. I will say Westbrook has played nine games at third base this spring, only two at second. So maybe they're thinking Urias mm. at second, Westbrook yeah. at third, which I guess is fine. It's just Urias has won a gold glove at third base, but I get that that doesn't always matter. <laughs> um, But okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that sounds about right. I. I don't know how you could he'll go down to triple A and he'll probably crush the ball and play fine defense. And they'll say, like, what are we doing? You know, we're trying to win a World Series this year with the one year we're going to have Corbin Burns. Like, let's let's go for this thing right now. So, yeah. All right. I, I think something we're saying is that, you know, the roster as it is constructed without Jackson Holiday won 101 games last year right. and lost virtually nobody. So the argument that if we just ride this for one month, we're probably going to be okay. I think is a very, very good one <laughs> yeah, and has a lot of basis in history. That's a good point too. And I think Elias does seem to view like the season in chunks. And I think early on his like view is always like, let's just like survive and figure out what we got everywhere. Right. We're good enough to still be in the thick of things. And then we'll go from there. Right. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. We just talked about it. We'll just mention it real quick. Both Colton Wong and Julio Tehran uh, have opted out of their Orioles contracts. When we started recording or we started talking this morning, we didn't know about Wong yet. Tehran officially is opted out and been giving his release. And then as we were talking here, Wong was done the same. So neither Wong or Tehran will make the Orioles and neither one will even be in the organization. So that's something interesting there. And I think we talked about Tehran possibly making the team as a long man or as like the fifth man in the rotation. Um, That's not going to happen. And Wong, I think we're all pretty happy that he's not going to be on the team because the bat just is, is brutal at this point. And I don't think you can trot that out there for a team that has uh world series aspirations. Um, yeah. The, on, the only yeah. comment I have on Tehran is just that we cannot get rid of Keegan Aiken. I don't know. No. He had a good I, spring. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he's got an option. He's got an option. Roster I know. Flexibility. How does he still have options? It's so <laughs> incredible. Like, I know it is amazing. Is it because he got yeah. hurt last year or something? Maybe they didn't have to use an option. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. But yeah, Keegan Aiken will be back. Well, we don't know yet. Keegan Aiken probably will be back. We also learned oh. Brian, Brian Baker got options. So 
We know, though. We know. <laughs> it's Keegan Aiken. Which, I, like, I will say, in the long man role, I kind of, like, I don't even know what to think about the long man role. I think it was Vance Worley the Orioles had years ago who was, like, amazing as the long man. <laughs> Not, but I wouldn't have wanted him starting games. Keegan Aiken, I kind of yeah. feel the same. Like maybe he'll be fantastic throwing three innings every Sunday. You know, like that's I'm cool with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But here we we'll go. See. All right, let's get into the season preview proper. Uh, we're gonna what we're gonna do is kind of cover a few basic questions we've got about the season going into it, and then we're gonna give some awards out or what we think are gonna be the awards for the season, and then wrap it up with our win loss totals as well as how far we think the Orioles will go. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll get into all that in just a second. I, Jess, you just dropped a line to me on the side that we want to talk about, uh, if the rotation is set or not, do you want to kind of run through that? I think you, uh, you were mentioning it just a moment ago. Do you have the rotation in front of you? Well, yeah. So it's going to be Corbin Burns and sorry to interrupt. Yeah, that's here. okay. Uh, but it. yeah, it's going to be Corbin Burns, Grayson Rodriguez, uh, then Tyler Wells, Dean Kramer, and is it Dean Kramer, Tyler Wells, or Tyler Wells? No, Dean it, Kramer? it was Wells, then Kramer. I saw, yeah, okay, gotcha. And then Irvin, yeah, okay, so. which the names are not surprising, but I will, you made it make a good point there. The order is a little bit interesting of Wells before Kramer. Do we, yeah. I mean, Wells had a really good spring. Um, any thoughts on that? Because I know we all, we were kind of all fans of Kramer in terms of his role, we like the back end arm, but. Uh, Jess, did you want to comment on that at all? Well, well, just more. We knew Kramer would be in the rotation yeah. and and Wells, we did not know was going to be in the rotation. So it's sort of funny to end up in a situation. Well, you know, the guy we didn't know was going to be in the rotation is ahead of the guy we knew was going to be in the rotation. Yeah. Uh, even though there makes it, it does make some sense because. Wells has been doing well in spring training and he he had a good start to the year last year. So um, there is logic to that, but it's just strange uh, that that's how things wound up. Yeah, I mean, two years in a row, he's had really good first half first halves that were borderline all star level that, you yeah. know, maybe, maybe they revert him to the bullpen again in the second half or maybe when means and Bradish are healthy. I don't know, but. Um, it does make things interesting because if he's pitching well and both well, or I'm sorry, both means and Bradish are healthy, then what are you doing? Is Kramer going to the pen? I, it's it's interesting to see. Um, we don't have to think about it now. We probably don't have to think about it until May because Bradish is probably not back until then at the earliest, but interesting nonetheless. Um, all right, well, let's get into the season preview then. So we started off, we've got a few questions here, like I mentioned. So I think the first thing we're going to talk about is just like kind of a, you know, thousand foot view what is the biggest question you have about the 2024 Orioles this could be something that you know you're a little bit unsure or you've got some trepidations about a part of the team or you know maybe something that's unsettled right now that you think will have a big impact on the team so Eli maybe I'll go to you first to kind of ask you what's the thing that you're maybe most unsure about and it's the biggest question you've got about the 2024 Orioles I, I think the single biggest question for me is Kyle Bradish. Um, when he returns, how good he looks, whether he, you know, once he returns, if he is back for the full season or if, you know, some injuries are lingering. Um, I, I think that there's nobody, you know, from the standpoint of like this question mark, this variable, um, who's more important in this sense. I, I think that the Orioles rotation as it is constructed right now is of course a major league rotation. You know, if Tyler Wells is leading the American league in whip, you know, then that front three will look pretty good through this first half without Bradish, without means. But if you add Kyle Bradish behind Corbin Burns and you go, you know, Burns, Bradish, Rodriguez, that is a top three that competes with any top three in the entire major leagues. And that is what sets you up for success in the, postseason more than anything um yeah. so i i think that you know bradish's status will kind of determine the ceiling of this team uh, i think that the floor is still you know a postseason team i think that you know this isn't i i don't think that he fully makes or breaks us as a postseason team itself but it's just raising that ceiling um is very very much contingent on his status i think yeah, it's a good point. I mean, the fact the Orioles have Corbin Burns, it, you feel good about it. If Imagine we didn't have Corbin Burns right now, and, and basically right. 
you know, Grayson Rodriguez is your opening day starter you feel okay about, but I think his second year, you don't necessarily feel great about him being like the ace of the staff. So yeah, Bradish being right. out and being up in the air and we know the UCL is already torn. Uh, it's, it's very worrisome. So that is a very yeah. good, very good question. Um, Jess, uh, what, what's your biggest question about the 2024 Orioles? Uh, I think Eli had a good question, but my biggest question I think is the bullpen. Um, <clears throat> there's just a lot of sort of instability. Um, we're relying on uh, Kimbrel to be the closer. Cano, who I like and I think is good. He's not the most reliable. Um, we'll see how well he does this year. Um, well, maybe it's not exactly fair to say he's not reliable, but he doesn't have a long track record of success in the majors. Um, he had a really good year last year, even though he sort of, I think, got overused and worn down and sort of struggled uh, toward the end of last year. Um, but the fact that we're relying um, sort of on those two big guys, and then uh, I was going to bring him up again a little later, but also Dylan Tate, after not having pitched in so long, he's sort of a question mark. So those are our three sort of back end guys. And, um, you know, the middle relief sort of brings up uh, even potentially more questions than the back end. <laughs> uh, but um, the back end is not uh, as solid as I would ideally want it to be. So this bullpen over the course of the year, I think, is something that the Orioles are going to sort of have to figure out uh, because it's it's not the most comforting bullpen uh, when you're looking at it. So, yeah, absolutely. We we had to do similar questions for Camden chat earlier this week, or, or I did, and the bullpen was the one I kind of threw out there as I think it's going to be OK, but we're putting a lot of, you know, chips in the in the pile for a lot of guys that I don't really know or have a ton of confidence in. So I, I think that's a good one. The only other thing I'll add as far as another question that we haven't covered yet is going to be a lineup question. This is if you've listened to the podcast during the offseason, I had an episode a few months ago about sort of the youth of the lineup and specifically the power lack of power rather in the lineup. And I think that's something I'm a little bit concerned about. Heston Kerstad didn't make this team. I'm sure he'll be up at some point. So right now your big power guys are still going to be um, Gunnar Henderson and Anthony Santander, who are good hitters, but these are more like 30 home run guys, not 40, 50 home run guys, which, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing. The Orioles are going to be, I think, again, sort of a deep offense rather than those like huge peaks. So obviously Gunnar, I think, has potential to put up crazy numbers and Adley's going to have awesome numbers for a catcher and 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 Santander will be very good, I think. But they aren't they don't have like that huge power bat in the middle of the lineup that I think a lot of the really good teams do. And we saw with the Rangers last year, they kind of just started hitting balls out of the park every every moment of the game. It's it felt like and that's kind of what led them to win the World Series. You know, you don't have to necessarily be a finished product right now. The Orioles don't necessarily have to have that power bat right now. Potentially Henderson emerges and hits a little bit more power than we're expecting, you know. But other than that, I'm not sure you're seeing a ton of that coming from within the organization throughout the year. Kerstad probably will come up and give a little pop. Holiday will be up at some point. I don't think you're going to think Holiday's going to be a 20 homer guy right right now. I think potentially he's eventually going to be a 20, 25 homer guy, but not as a 20 year old, not in his first season. So I think the the lack of power is a little bit concerning for me. And, and because of that, you're going to have to make up for it in some other ways. You're going to have to get on base a lot. You're going to have to manufacture a lot of runs, steal some bases. They did that well last year. Can they do it again this year? Um, I'm a little bit concerned about. I think it'll be a good offense, but to make it a great offense, you probably need a little bit more pop than I'm seeing uh, right now. So that would be the other other big question that I've got. Um, before we move on, any other any other lingering questions that we didn't didn't cover there? Anything that you want to add to that we did talk about? No. All right. Mm, we'll move. Good. We'll move on. Um, so then, this question is sort of related to that, but more to more like focusing in on a specific player. I phrased it in our outline as maybe a player that we're not talking about enough that could have a big impact on the team in 2024. But I think maybe a simpler way of thinking about it is kind of that X factor player on the 2024 Orioles. So not typically like your Cy Young award winner, your MVP candidate, but somebody a little bit less um, high profile that is going to have a big impact on the 2024 Orioles. Do, do either one of you have one ready to, to go? If I can go to one of you. Eli's got one. He shook his head. Eli, who's your yeah. X factor? Honestly, I think the X factor for me is um, 
I was caught between going the bullpen route or going the rotation route, but I think I'm going to stick with the rotation. And I think Dean Kramer is like a really interesting kind of linchpin for me. Um, I think that, you know, we can assume Cole Irvin will be a steadily below average major league starter. And that's, you know, not an insult to him. He's a number five and the average is a number three. That's all I mean by it. (laughs) Um, But so I think that, um, you know, Tyler Wells, optim- like I think as we've talked about, the optimal configuration of this team is that we eventually move him to the pen. You get that huge six foot seven high hop fastball, you know, coming out of the back end of your pen. I think that's the like happiest spot that the Orioles can get to. And I, I think that is very much contingent upon Dean Kramer having success in the starting role. Um, and shoring up the rotation to enable that transition for Wells back into the pen. Um, I, you you know, I think that, uh, you know, Bradish will obviously be a huge factor, you know, on how important this is, what his return looks like. And you could even say means to an extent. Um, I'm going to say something that I think a lot of Orioles fans might not like, but for me, the Delta between means and Irvin is not really that huge, you know, assuming that either one of them ends up in the number five role one game a week, giving up one or two more runs. I think we're going to, you know, we're going to survive the season either way. I I like, I think John means is better, but I think it's just not too consequential as to which of those lefties is holding down a spot in the rotation. Um, But if that spot in the rotation is number four and number five, I think makes a huge difference. Whether Dean Kramer can come out and, look like a number three starter, um, I think will set this team up for a lot of success uh, if he does. And if he doesn't, I think the bullpen questions that Jesse was just talking about become larger and larger and larger um, as you need to use those guys more and more through the back half of your rotation. Yeah, I mean, the back of the rotation can definitely make or break a team. It's it's those guys that, well, Kramer did make the postseason rotation last year, but you see a lot of right. teams kind of, they move that last starter to, to the bullpen in the in the postseason, but they provide you those 150 really important innings throughout the year. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, Jess, uh, who's your X factor? Yeah, I was actually going to say Tyler Wells. Um, I think it's just a bit of a question. Um <clears throat> The question for me is like, how deep can he go into this season? Can he pitch complete season uh, being in the starting rotation? Um, And exactly how effective is he going to be? So um, obviously we've seen good things from him in the past, but sort of, you know, some some things uh, I know you've pointed out in the past, Tyler, like the low strikeout rate that are slightly consistent. Uh, concerning for sort of long-term effectiveness. Um, But yeah, if he can put a full season together and if he does have to get moved to the bullpen, what does that look like? And is he able to be competent once he gets to the bullpen? Um, So yeah, I, to me, he's uh, if, if he is good, I think he'll take a lot of pressure off the rotation, right? Um, If something doesn't work out with means, And, you know, things are worse than they actually are. If we have a good, effective, healthy Tyler Wells, you know, the 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 hit of not having means won't be as worrisome or won't be as concerning. Um, And same with Bradish, too, obviously, if things are are uh, if he struggles uh, recovering and being effective when he returns. So um, I think, uh, yeah, Tyler Wells would just alleviate a lot of pressure on the rotation if he were to sort of be first half Tyler Wells all season long this year. Um, I have, you know, legitimate and I think real skepticisms that he can actually do that. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Tyler Wells at his peak as a starter is a really good major league caliber starter. He just needs to show he can do it for an entire season, you know? So I almost, I'm not even worried about him in April and May, but come June, July, when it's getting hotter and the season drags on, uh, he's shown he gets fatigued and you can't have that. He's going to be out of the rotation if that's the case again. So I think that's a good point as well. I'll go on the offense or to the position players for my X factor. And I'm going to name Cedric Mullins as the X factor. Hmm. We saw Cedric early last year look like not quite 2021 Cedric Mullins, but really, really good. 
He had an OPS of 794 in April, OPS of 877 in May. And then in late May, he had that abductor injury. He came back at the end of June, struggled, got hurt again in July, struggled. His OPS in September was 565. And then I think he went over in the ALDS sweep to the Texas Rangers. He also through May, he stole 13 bases. And then for the rest of the season, he stole six bases. I think, you know, Cedric Mullins, he's probably not going to be the leadoff hitter as much this year as he has been in previous seasons. We know he's got some limitations offensively, but obviously defensively, he's still stellar. But the Orioles need his bat to be somewhat close to what it has been in previous seasons, um, or at least prior to the second half of last year, where it was just really kind of a black hole in the lineup. Uh, they can't they can't handle that day in and day out again. They need some production from him. They need some stolen bases from him because he's going to be the center fielder. But we've seen, you know, he gets hurt. He's gotten hurt in spring training already. He's come back. If he gets hurt again, it sounds like Colton Kowser will probably be the everyday center fielder, which maybe that's okay. But we've also heard for a long time that he projects more as a corner outfielder than a center fielder. And if it's not him, then is it Ryan McKenna again? You know, we've done that before. We don't want to be back there. So, you know, Cedric Mullins is just such an exciting player when he's right. And when he's healthy, he provides power. He steals bases. He's a great fielder. Um, the Orioles, the 2024 Orioles need him because as I kind of just laid out, they don't have a ton of power, so they need to be able to manufacture runs. And I think that he's kind of a one man manufacturing run kit there. Um, so hopefully Cedric Mullins is healthy and hundred percent and the Orioles get the best out of him. Um, cause I think he's be, a, he'd be a huge boost to him. Um, all right. Any other like players on the fringes there that we want to talk about before we move on to our bold predictions? No. All right. Now, bold predictions. I, I know we didn't really prep for this all that much, but, you know, this can kind of be a continuation of other questions as well. Is there anything we're kind of expecting to happen in 2024 that maybe the the average person isn't isn't anticipating anything bold? Does anyone want to volunteer there? Jesse, you've picked the yeah. mic up I, Go for it. I, I, I can say to uh, somewhat. Uh, well, I guess you both can judge how bold they are. Um, okay. But I, I'll say that Dylan Tate is going to be our best bullpen piece. Um, he's okay. going to be our best reliever over the course of the year. Um, now, I don't know how bold that is because, you know, I think most people are thinking he'll be in the top three. Yeah. Um, I, I think people would have him after Cano, Kimbrell um, would have Tate right there. Uh, but yeah, I think over the course of the year, I think he'll be the best bullpen uh, arm we have. So do you think that happens because he's so good or because Kimbrel and Cano struggle or a little well, bit? Well, I, th I think a mix of both. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think uh, I think Tate over the course of a year, um, like he's been good in the past. We've seen him have uh, really good stretches. Um, now he hasn't pitched in a long time, so, you know where is his health going to be at um but uh i could definitely yeah i think um i i think it's sort of a mix of both i don't think cano will have a sub two era this year um and kimbrell is is he's fine um but you know he's he's you know he's getting older and uh, I, I would expect his uh era to be in the threes by the end of the year um you know, potentially yeah. the the higher threes, even. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll see. <laughs> you like very low on very low on Kimbrel. <laughs> well, I when I say I mean over three five, you know, and I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised to see that. So, okay, yeah, fair enough. I you know, there's questions in the bullpen, and Tate is certainly one of them. So I would love to see him have a bounce back. He, you know, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of like his style out of the pen, but he's been effective in general. So I, I would, that seems totally plausible. Um, but I like it. I like it. Um, Eli, anything bold on your end there? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think for, I've got kind of two tiers. My realistic bold okay. is that Grayson Rodriguez and Corbin Burns will be top five in American league Cy Young voting. Um, okay. The Orioles will have two guys in the top five in Cy Young voting. And my bold, bold is Corbin Burns wins it, and we go okay. one two. <laughs> oh, okay, wow. But with, Gar with Garrett Cole out, yeah, you know, like the competition has gone down a little bit, of course. So that's the bold, bold, and 
probability on that is like below 10 percent. but the other one i actually feel pretty confident in. well yeah the burns i wouldn't say burns is a lock for like top five in cy young but you know it's it's his contract year he's gonna go get paid why not you know top it off with a cy young win i think that's totally possible and and grayson we saw second half grayson he was cy young caliber so i don't think it's you know, impossible. Um, but I like it because you wouldn't two two players on the same team. I think voters tend to not think of it that way. They're like, oh, well, the right. one guy is carrying the weight and the other guy is just on his coattails. But I like it. I like it. Um, What's I'll, yours, Tyler? Yeah, I, I'll stick in the in the award area as well and talk rookie of the year. And, you know, we just talked earlier about Jackson Holiday coming up, you know, late April, early May. That's still plenty of time to kind of get in the rookie of the year conversation. But I think that he will not be the Oriole that's the highest in the rookie of the year voting mm. for 2024. I think Colton Cowser will be higher in the rookie of the year voting than Jackson holiday. I'm just, I'm, I'm a Cowser fan right now. And I don't know how bold this really is because he had a fantastic spring and he was great in triple a, but then he really struggled last year in the big leagues. And there are some questions and there's, there's possible it's possible. He's not even an everyday starter for the Orioles. You know, we don't know what the outfield is going to look like, but my expectation is that, Santander plays a lot more DH and a little first base this year. Ryan O'Hearn kind of comes back to earth a little bit and maybe eventually gets squeezed out. Then it becomes Santander, Mountcastle doing the first base DH dance. And then Kowser is going to find his way into that right field job most days. And it's going to be enough. And he's going to play an exciting brand of baseball to, to finish. Maybe he doesn't win the award, but maybe top three and still gets the Orioles. I think they get like international picks or something. And then he gets his full year of service time, which he'll get anyway. But um, that's kind of my prediction. I don't know if that qualifies as bold, but um, I, I'm going with. I definitely respect it. Um, I feel like uh, to me, I was so, uh, I guess, scarred from having him be <laughs> in the major leagues and watching him. <laughs> so I think there's that angle of it. And then also, yeah, I think this playing time question for him is going to be a significant mm -hmm. question mark too. And whether... Uh, I think he's really going to have to play himself into more playing time. Uh, so I know it was a bold prediction and, you know, I'm not, I'm not coming at that as if, you know, how are you guessing that? But uh, I do have uh, just my inclinations. I have severe reservations, but we'll see. It's fair enough. It's mm. fair enough. But I know we'll, uh, we'll revisit this at the end of the year if we remember to do that. And uh, I'll definitely remember if Colton Kowser ends up top three in uh Rookie of the Year voting. I will be certain to bring this back up again. Please do. Um, all right. Uh, real quick. What is the team ceiling? I think, you know, we know that this team is quite good. They won 101 games last year, won the AL East, but then got swept out of the ALDS. So, I mean, I'll just say that I think it's realistic to say that this team ceiling is winning a World Series. But do either of you guys disagree? Do you think there's something? Eli says yes right away. Um, I say yes. Winning a World Series is is the Orioles' team ceiling. Jesse, do you think that this is uh, that's inappropriate to say that this team is a, is a World Series contender? I definitely don't think. Obviously, it's not inappropriate to say if we have a team we know is basically we quote unquote know is going is going to be in the playoffs. Of course, anything can happen in the playoffs. Um, I do. I mean, of course, we'll see how things look when we get to the playoffs, but I do worry about this team being wonder about whether not that we can't make a run at it, uh, not that we can't do some damage in the playoffs and get past the first round like we didn't do last year, um, but at least how it's looking right now, I'll be very, you know, when we are making playoff predictions, I'm imagining myself making playoff predictions down the line when we get to that point. And I feel like I'm going to have to do a lot of convincing to talk myself <laughs> into the Orioles winning the world series when we get there. Um, but with that said, obviously, I mean, we had a great regular season last year. We expect to semi repeat that um, or, you know, do something resembling it. So you can't say this isn't a world series contender if it's a team we know will be in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But with that said, we'll see. And maybe Elias goes and gets someone at the deadline that, you know, we're not anticipating and, you know, there's time for things to change, of course. But uh, 
I'm I'm anxious about it in terms of actually being a World Series contender, mainly because of how young we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's fair. I mean, it's it's definitely not perfect, and the injuries to the pitching staff coming into spring, I think, definitely put a damper on things a tad because that felt like such a strength, and now it's a little bit less so. And then you factor in the Bautista injury, which we already knew about, but um, certainly not quite as strong. But yeah, you you never know, and. The, the regular season doesn't have to be perfect, as we saw with the Texas Rangers last year. They certainly didn't have a perfect um, regular season, and that worked out okay for them. But, yeah, fair enough. So I think we all agree that it is like their ceiling is the World Series, though, but Jesse's just kind of a little bit more trepidatious about it than than Eli and myself, which is fair. That's fair. All right. Let's talk about potential awards for the Orioles this season. First, let's go with well, let's go with team rookie of the year because that or, or the team rookie of the year, which uh, you know I think I kind of gave away what I think there. So maybe Eli, I'll go to you to to see who you think will win rookie, who will be the Orioles' best rookie this season. It it's difficult because it, it really <laughs> is about playing time for me. He doesn't want to make cause... me feel bad, is is what he's saying. No, 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 no. <laughs> I I I am leaning Cowser, but I oh. also think that. Um, the second that Jackson Holiday touches down in Baltimore, he's going to spend every day in the lineup in a way yeah. that Colton Cowser will not for the first at least couple months of the year until you know Ryan O'Hearn gets pushed out, like you said, until we make a trade in the outfield, something. Um, I think I have to say Holiday. I think Holiday gets more <laughs> playing time. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's no, it's it's <laughs> the not boring a bad answer, pick. but it's not a yeah. bad pick because you're totally right. He if he's up, he's playing every single day, so that's right. totally fair. Um, Jess, what do you think? So I guess because of that, um, I, I yeah, I mean, I'm gonna say <laughs> Holiday too. Um, I mean, okay. the the question is like it. It is just about like when he does come up, like do the Orioles really try to finagle this? And, you know, like people were saying uh, before that you mentioned, like do the Orioles really push him off and obviously do a Gunnar Henderson type thing with him? Obviously, if that's the situation, then, you know, no matter how good he plays in the final month, we can't really say he's, you know, yeah, no, uh, the, the rookie of the year for the Orioles. But yeah, I just, I think, Sort of like Eli said, um, you know, I expect Kowser to struggle a bit. Uh, I don't think he's going to get consistent playing time. And then when Jackson Holiday does make the majors, right, he will be playing every day, basically. So I think that's the difference between the two. So, yeah, I just I mean... want to clarify. I, I never said I thought Kowser would struggle. <laughs> I think Kowser is I think oh, going right, to be great. Right. I just think like, yeah, playing time will be an issue. It's something I could see with Kowser though is is potentially doing similar to what Gunner did, where Gunner kind of played third base a day, shortstop a day. I feel like Gunner right. played second base occasionally. I could see uh, Kowser doing that in the outfield. Like they're going to give Mullins maybe more days off than normal, so he stays healthy. He'll play center. They're going to give Tony a day off, so he'll play right. He'll play. You right. know, they don't want Hayes to get hurt, so he'll play. I could see him playing all over. So maybe he doesn't play the same position six days, seven days a week, but he'll play somewhere six days a week is kind of what yeah. I'm thinking right now. And then if he plays well, they might just solidify him and give him a spot, which I know, Jesse, you hate that for rookies. You hate putting them all over the field. You like to just give them position and there's some validity to that. But I think the Orioles have demonstrated that they don't abide by that. We don't do that. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stick with Kowser, but holiday will be great too. I think they po- both could potentially finish like top, five top three and in, in rookie of the year voting so which would be great nobody for kerstad huh no i he he's striking out too much and he's a bat only guy i you right. know holiday does some stuff on the bases some defense Kowser does some defense kerstad he's got to be hitting or it's not gonna work and i've got some doubts uh right now um all right team cy young i think jesse last year you got this one correct or or who got who got it right last year i can't remember Jesse got it. Okay. Oh no, it was two years ago. It, oh, okay. Jesse said Kramer two years ago, and we were okay. all like, "Ha!" And then he ended up being right. <laughs> I got I got Henderson last year. I think that's oh, what for, you're thinking for of. MVP. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so Cy Young 2024 for the Orioles. Eli, I think you kind of just told us basically what you're thinking there, but do you want to reiterate who your expectation is? Yeah, Corbin Burns. I think he will cakewalk to it. I, it's yeah. gonna be easy. He's <laughs> yeah. 
he's incredible. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the bona fide ace the Orioles haven't had in our well, not our entire lives, but since we weren't really watching baseball yet. So it's pretty, pretty insane. Uh, Jess, what do you think? Yeah, I second that, of course. Uh, I mean, like there's no. I'm saying this, but there's no realistic chance in my mind that <laughs> Grayson Rodriguez, you know, outcompetes Corbin Burns. Uh, you know, just if we're looking at the number of innings pitched they're going to have by the end of the year, Corbin Burns, I think, is going to have many more uh, than than Grayson will, and they're going to be qual- like more quality innings too. So, um, yeah, I mean, Grayson, I guess, would be his, I guess, quote unquote, threat. Uh, to win that, especially with Bradish not uh starting, you know, uh starting injured. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I don't, I don't really barring uh Corbin Burns getting injured, I don't see any way it doesn't go to Burns. Yeah, I'm I'm of the same mind. I try to twist my brain and see how Grayson Rodriguez could do it. And I mean, there is a yeah. there's a way. Like he was so good in the second half, but Burns was really good in the second half for the Brewers too. Um, and he's just been there, done that. And he's got the motivation of, I'm going to make a ton of money and I'll make even more if I can win a Cy Young for potentially the best team in the AL. So not that he needs the motivation, but I think it's going to push him across the finish line there. Yeah. I I think the note that Jesse made about innings too, is a pretty significant one. Corbin Burns is somebody who will, you know, pretty regularly run up over 200 innings in a season and, Grayson Rodriguez, you know, I'm not sure he's necessarily going to be limited, but, you know, if you're in the fifth inning and he's at 84 pitches or, you know, I'm fifth yeah. inning, he's at 94 pitches, he's not going back out for the sixth. And I think right. Corbin Burns probably is. So, well, and plus, that's like from the Orioles' perspective, too, is like, we got this guy one year, let's ride him versus right. <laughs> we're going to have Grayson for four more, five more years. Like, let's take care of this yeah. guy. There is definitely that. CC Sabathia Brewers era <laughs> aspect to it. Three days rest, complete game. <laughs> <laughs> Insanity. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk team MVP, which there there could be overlap with Cy Young and rookie of the year with team MVP. So if we want to double dip there, I think that's totally fine. This doesn't have to go to a position player in their second or longer year. But uh, Eli, I'll go to you for maybe who your team MVP is going to be in, in 2024. Yeah, I, I mean, it's down to two choices. And I think that'll be a clean sweep across the board between the two. That's just who you pick. Um, I th- I think it'll end up being Gunner, um, but Adley is obviously going to be up there and in the conversation just on, you know, the value he provides as a catcher alone. Okay, fair enough. But no, no inkling of Corbin Burns just being both Cy Young MVP nah. pulling, pulling a Justin Verlander. I don't think so. No. Yeah. Okay. I don't see it. Fair enough. Uh, Jess, what do you think? Go back to your guy Gunner or. Going somewhere yeah, else. I mean, I have to um, <laughs> just basically, I mean, a lot of it is right. The power, the defense, uh, the defense at such a critical position. Um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I think he's he's very likely to be the Orioles MVP um, and or the MBO. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there are. I think there are, unlike in the uh, in the previous question, there are pathways right for other guys to sort of get it. Um, theoretically, you know, I could see a situation where, I mean, not that I think this is likely to happen, but if Gunner hits twenty six home runs this year and Santander, you know, hits thirty seven, um, and can sort of like just mashes the ball and you know, puts up a, a 900 OPS or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a situation where something like that could potentially happen or Adley, um, like putting up bigger offensive numbers than we're expecting. Um, you know, there is sort of, or if Mullen somehow like returns to what he was in 2021 and okay, maybe doesn't have a 30, 30 season, but plays stellar defense and is healthy all year and uh you know that sort of thing so i think there are uh situations where it could not be gunner uh but um you know assuming uh henderson is healthy uh i think he's a he's a pretty good favorite for it 
Yeah, I mean, he just does so many things on the bases, at the plate, in the field that I think, you know, Adley Rutschman's the other big contender for the award here just because he does similar things and he does it at a crucial position behind the plate that, you know, I think he's clearly the best catcher in baseball right now, whereas Gunner probably isn't clearly the best shortstop in baseball. But ultimately, Gunner does so many things that Adley falls just a little bit short of him there. I kind of talked about this in one of my episodes over the summer or over the winter, too. He just has more of those MVP qualities, stealing bases, hitting home runs that Adley doesn't quite do that. I'll go for Gunner as well, but would not be shocked if, you know, Gunner has a 10 day or 15 day IL stint. Adley has a hot two weeks there and pulls ahead of him in a couple of like accumulative categories and maybe pulls it out. But I'll say I'll say Gunner as well and give us a clean sweep on MVP and Cy Young. The the. Rare. The uh, the playing time is also sort of a yeah. critical distinction between Adley and, and Henderson, too, right? Because Adley, being a catcher, is going to need to require more rest. And that, uh, even if he's DHing, would at least take away from his defensive value and that sort of thing. Whereas Henderson will basically be playing any day he's not on an IL stint. So. Right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they've talked about having Adley play first base a little bit, but that never happened last year, and I'm not sure it's going to happen this year either. So, yeah, that's a very valid point. All right, let's wrap this up with our predictions on win totals and then also how far we think the Orioles go this year. To give you guys a little bit of context, the Orioles over-under is a little bit low, in my opinion, on the betting markets right now. FanDuel has it at 89.5, and and then a lot of the other ones have it at 90.5. So... Eli, what do you got there as far as win totals? I feel like we're all going to go the over there, but you know, if you want to go under, that's cool too. But what do you think for win total? And then how far are the Orioles going to go this year? Yeah, I'm taking the over. Um, I'm going to call it 94 and 68. Okay. I think that, you know, I, I think that any 101 team is due for some regression, unless you are the Braves who... <laughs> are the Braves uh, or the Dodgers, for example. Um, And, you know, it's not necessarily a regression in the sense of you're going to play worse. It's just a regression in the sense of like, it's a very like specific set of performances that require you to win 101 games. And it's not always indicative of how good the team is. So like, I think the team is just as good this year is what I'm trying to say. And I I think the win total goes down a little bit. Um, I call it 94 wins, but I think we are solidly toward the top of the division um, and, you know, competing to win the AL East again. I think that how far we go. <laughs> Do you want us to come back to you? <laughs> it's just such a mean question. I, you know, I like, unless I say we win the World Series, I look like I'm a hater. Um, no, it's you want them to win the World Series, but, right. you know. No, I, I, I think we... I think we can make it to the CS. Okay. And then something will happen. I don't even know who I think would beat <laughs> us, but yeah, it's it, it's tough. The AL doesn't have like really juggernauts right now. It's maybe right. the maybe the Astros and the Rangers are right there with the Orioles. It's it's tough. That's exactly it. And there's a chance that everyone has been hating on all the projections saying that the Yankees are going to win the AL East, and I also do not think the Yankees should win the AL East, but what I do think is that if you find yourself in a situation where Garrett Cole gets healthy and you're staring down Juan Soto and Aaron Judge in October, that's a yeah. really unpleasant situation to be in. <laughs> so yeah, that's a good point. They're they're a good team and they they were worse last year because Judge was hurt for so long. And if he's not, they yeah. are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um right. that's fair. Jess, what about you? Well, 94 was my number two, uh, <laughs> coincidentally. So, we can ride together. Uh, yeah. So, we can do this um, together. For sure. Um, so I'll take 94 uh, wins as well. Um, and yeah, uh, just sort of the same thing Eli said. I think there's just going to be natural regression. Uh, a lot of things had to go right. Uh, now everyone sort of knows the Orioles are good and legitimate. Um. So I would like to think that the Orioles are going to improve uh, upon the postseason performance last year. I do think we'll win the first round uh, of the playoffs. 
Um, and then I ha- I would put us going out in the second round. So, so the I'm C- definitely you got him going out in the CS. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So because they did. I mean, they right. got to the DS last year. Right. Yeah, right. 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 So the right. The question would be about like. um yeah, I mean, so, right, because it would depend on if the Orioles have the win. wild card or not. Right, right. exactly. So, so you um, say win the division, and so the second round becomes the CS. So yeah, get, correct, get the correct, CS. correct. So, Fair enough. Um, yeah, I just think uh, the th- the disappointing thing, I mean, granted, I'm happy we have Burns, of course. I, I don't know if I really made this case, but although no. I'm happy we have Burns, it would have been more I would have liked to have seen the Orioles not not honestly like the only disappointing thing sorry to be going in circles okay. here the only disappointing thing about having Burns is that we have an ace for one year and I would have ideally liked to have seen the Orioles have gotten an ace that is going to carry us longer through our hopeful window of success here so now I understand, you know, overall, we didn't give up a ton to get Burns. Like, I think it was a good acquisition. Like he was what was available. So I'm not saying that the Orioles even should have done something right. differently or anything, <clears throat> but it would have been nicer from my perspective because uh, I'm thinking about our playoff performance last year um, and just thinking about how we just went out immediately and, we have burns and hopefully that'll do something to change that trajectory. Um, but I would have liked to have seen somebody, another ACE we have for a few years yeah. um, to sort of carry us down the line. So that's um, it, it just, it feels like a lot to try to win it this year, which having burns for one year, it sort of feels like that, but I would imagine next year, the Orioles are going to go get somebody uh, that's another sort of ace type pitcher uh, to replace Burns. So we'll see what happens. But um, yeah. I think yeah. I, it, to me, it feels like Elias is kind of saying like, all right, Bradish and Grayson will graduate to be that yeah. ace level player. That's and, what I think right, too. Right. So, but all right, fair enough. And I, I want to say real quick, the uh, Pythagorean win loss for the Orioles last year, based on their run scored and runs allowed was 94 and 68. So maybe that's where we're getting the, 94 and 68 vibes um i was gonna probably say 94 as well and i think i did in a camden chat piece coming this week so (laughs) but i'll say i'll say here i'll say 95 wins i say they win the division and heck i'll say they go to the world series this year i think they they maybe lose it to one of the dodgers or or the braves they're just so good and full of talent but i'll say they get through maybe hopefully bradish's elbow holds together then you've got your one two three really good to get you to the world series and it's just too much to beat one of the nl teams but um i'm going to be the optimist of the group and keep us a little bit different put some room between us and that's what i'll go with (laughs) in a way that that's going to be crushing (laughs) even more crushing than sort of going out earlier uh in a way uh yeah yeah but it it uh, would be but i'll take it i'll still take it i would be happy to watch more orioles baseball for another whatever two weeks that gets you and they lose, they lose, but you know, that's part of the game. It's I would love to go to a World Series game at Camden Yards and I would figure out a way to do it if it happens this year. That would be pretty cool. Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. And though I guess the only, at least in my mind, the reason I'm saying that is because if the Orioles go to the World Series and then lose, and then the following year the Orioles make the playoffs and don't get to the World Series, then it sort of feels like you took a step backwards. You know, rather than yeah. so I'm obviously it doesn't work like that. And, you know, but it would be crushing to to get to the World Series, but then lose it. Uh, it I think it I, would be I'm but... partially like saving myself a little bit by like, you know, not having like these massive, massive ambitions uh, for the Orioles this year, even though yeah. we probably should, because, yeah, low expectations. You want to exceed them and that'll make you feel a little bit <laughs> right. Better. A little That's bit. Fair. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that covers everything we've got there. So I think we'll probably start to wrap it up here. Just to remind you guys where you can follow us. You can follow us on Instagram threads and Twitter at the warehouse pod. You can subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't already, we are on Spotify, Apple, Google, all the places you get your podcasts. We are available. Just search for us by name and we should pop up there. 
This episode's coming out right before opening day. And that's going to start our in-season coverage of the Orioles. Just to give you guys a quick heads up there, that's going to basically be series recaps and as well as any news that pops up during those series we'll cover after every single series. I will do a special episode this coming week uh, after opening day. It'll either come, it'll probably come Friday if opening day does go on as scheduled on Thursday. If the weather holds up, I'll have an episode out on Friday recapping that and any other big news of the day. So make sure you're inclu- you're uh, subscribed and following so you get all the episodes directly to your feed. If you haven't, we haven't done it yet. We have a YouTube page as well. If you search for us there, The Warehouse Pod will pop up and you can see us and our beautiful faces talking about the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, it's been great engagement over there. We're at, a big, I think, about 255 subscribers now. If we can get to 300 you know, by maybe the end of April, that would be huge. We'd really appreciate it. So give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, a comment, all that jazz. And uh, if you're on YouTube right now, comment uh, your Orioles win-loss predictions as well. Love to see if you, we are all thinking 94 and 68 or if there's maybe some differing opinions <laughs> um, in the Orioles community. But I think that's all we've got for now, guys. We'll be back on Friday with an opening day recap. Until then... I'm Tyler. I'm Jesse. And I'm Eli. And this has been the Warehouse Podcast. Thanks for listening.